Welcome to our series of Healthcare Scene Google Plus Hangouts, where we sit down with top leaders in healthcare IT. My name is John Lin, the founder of healthcarescene.com. Thanks for joining us. And today we're excited to have the always insightful, the always energetic, the passionate healthcare IT expert, advocate, and also social media expert. How, how's that? Is that enough titles? Wow. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe how generous you are, John. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe I should give you your proper title. He, Dr. Nick is the CMIO at Nuance Healthcare, an expert in all things healthcare IT. So I'm pleased to have you here with me today. Thank you. You're very generous. Always delightful to uh, chat with you, John. Great. So, you know, today's topic is CES 2015. CES is the Consumer Electronics Show held in Las Vegas because it's so large that Vegas is the only city that can hold it. So, you know, give people an idea of how massive was CES this year. <laughs> well, so uh, it, it's interesting you say that, that Las Vegas is the only place that can hold it. Um, I would suggest that it's struggling. Uh, one of the things that I notice, and I go to other shows at Las Vegas, even big ones, um, and I've never had such connectivity problems uh, <laughs> connecting to the internet, even, uh, believe it or not, making phone calls. Um, the infrastructure, certainly from an IT perspective, was so overwhelmed. I believe the figures were 170,000. Uh, people that translated, um, you know, to give you a visual, uh, you see queues of people for taxis uh, at the airport or at hotels. That was a mandatory requirement for anybody that was looking to get a cab anywhere. I didn't even try Uber to see how quickly they might show up. Um, but in most instances, you were talking 30 to 45 minutes for a, a taxi. Um, uh, the place was awash with technical uh, folks who were consuming every last ounce of bandwidth, and uh, it was creaking at the uh, at the joints. Interesting. Uh, I think you might need to change providers. I didn't have any connectivity issues, so <laughs> a shout out to Verizon. Uh, you know, thank you, Verizon, for good connectivity. But I, you know, I have two providers because well, actually I've got three because I have my MiFi unit, which is Verizon. I've got AT and T, which is on my iPhone and I have um, a net provider for my Android. All three. So I think they just treat you special because you're a local. <laughs> if only. But you're right, it is massive. And the thing that blew me away was that you know it's always taken up the convention center. It's always taken up every last ounce of the sands, which most conferences that will just fill up the sands or just fill up part of the convention center, but it did all of those, including uh, what's it called now? It's called the Westgate, I guess it used to be the right. LVH, used to be the Hilton. It's renamed three times. All of that, and now it even expanded to the Aria, which sadly I didn't make it there because I ended up getting sick the day I was going to go over to the Aria. But all of the marketing people for these consumer electronics were over at the Aria, and from what I hear. There was a massive following there, plus Mandalay Bay, which is another venue that could hold an enormous event, had all of the initial press stuff, the, the press briefings, the CES unveiled. I mean, if, if think about the size of that. Um, so it's not surprising that, uh, that, the, it, that the travel issues are there, that the bandwidth issues are there. Uh, that's why I'm glad I have my own car, so <laughs> that, that's interesting. I'm not sure that that was actually a good thing. Um... Uh, driving around was uh, a challenge, but you're right. It was across, spread across many different venues, and you know that's even in an instance where they have large venues. Um, and, and I would say one of the downsides was that that difficulty in terms of going to each of those different places, although they did try and segment it. And I think the one that you missed, which was essentially an outdoor version, um, which was outside, I think CES West or East. Sorry, can't remember which one. Was all the cars. Um, there was a big display with the self-driving car, well, not self-driving, they did show them, you weren't able to get in them, um, but there was a number of opportunities for folks to go out. Um, one of the thoughts I had was maybe I could get their cars and drive from, you know, each of the events, but that wasn't on offer, so. Ah, the future of CES is self-driving cars between venues. I, I oh, should... yeah. I'm certain that's going to happen. <laughs> Well, it was also interesting because the digital health is, has really grown at CES over the years. Initially, I mean, I've been going for, I, I think, 10 years. Uh, I might have missed one or two along the way. But, uh, you know, in the beginning, I looked for digital health, and there was just nothing. 
you know, I mean, maybe in some Microsoft booth, they would have one little thing that said health that, you know, wasn't really a health thing. And then they started the Digital Health Summit, which I think is what started bringing together all of these sensors and wearables. And this year, they, they literally moved it from the convention center over to the Venetian. And it took up about a half of the Venetian, I guess technically it's the SANS uh, convention space, it took up about half of the space. Uh, yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts on the growth of that? And, and then also, what, what, were the, what were the interesting things you found there? Well, I, so I have to be honest, it's, it, you know, in many respects, it's gratifying um, because obviously from a focal point, that's one of the areas that I really am interested in. Um, you know, CES for a tech, for a geek is always interesting, but the blending of those two worlds and obviously the focal um, aspect of that, bringing it all together in one place, ostensibly in one place, although you can find many other relevant uh, pieces in other parts of the floor, for me it was very exciting because you walked in and you go, wow, they're really paying attention to this. This is, you know, part of our future, which was one of the reasons I posted the sort of, um, uh, you know, brief introduction predictions, a little bit, you know, uh, jumping on the back of some of your thoughts around that with 3D printing, drones, um, and wearables. And, you know, that was all brought together in a single um, hall um, and, you know, divided into sections, um, you know, from a standout perspective. So you'd sort of pulled out or called out 3D printing, I think, um, you know, just today I saw uh, a post that talked about um, uh, pediatric surgery that was being planned using 3D printing. Right now it's very simplified because the materials are somewhat limited, although I heard repeatedly that there's some opportunity to now incorporate metals, hmm. um, conductivity, um, and uh, separately food stuff. So, you know, bringing to life the concept of Star Trek and the replicator is, you know, albeit I couldn't wait that long for my piece of food. <laughs> <laughs> some of the duration. You but yeah, right. And you can see the direction that that's going in. And, uh, you know, conceptually, the metals is important because now they're going to be printing circuits into things that they generate as part of 3D printing. Um, so I think there's huge opportunity there. Obviously, the drones, and we've seen a little bit of that with um, uh, the ability to both provide um, coverage that um, you know allows visibility of what's going on from a medical standpoint I think we've seen medical drones that bring in help um, mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, again simplified at this point but the rapidity with which you can access some uh, location um, the average traffic in London and I don't know in other cities but certainly in London it is somewhere of the order of six to nine miles per hour that's how bad the traffic is and if you're in an ambulance, there's only so far that they can sort of speed things up. So the ability to bring help in, you know, it's interesting to me, and I saw a little bit of that from the folks. Obviously, wearables and the Internet of Things, for me, was the big thing. I mean, I'm a, you know, wearable guy. I love all of this technology. I've been through a number of these sensors. And, uh, you know, whilst one of my colleagues saw this and said, yeah, I see this, but he was overwhelmed, I think he was overwhelmed because there's still a shakeout to happen. You know, everybody's saying, wow, this is an interesting place. You know, what stands out? What was it? And I was really looking for people that were doing more with that. What, what could they offer? I had an interesting discussion with a number of them about sharing of information. And, you know, I know you're passionate about this. I know I certainly am. Um, you know, it was interesting to see these vendors who were saying, yeah, we're going to create this universe and we want you to use our tools to track and use all of this information. And I, I would challenge each of them, and you know, mostly I was talking to people on um, their booths, and they would sort of say, no, no, you have to use our software. The exception to that was interesting. I don't know if you came across these guys, but Under Armour had a big stand. They've moved completely away from developing sensors, and they're trying to create the universe and say, we'll plug into anything and everything, and we want to create the tools and the techniques to provide the value add to all of that, which I thought was interesting and I think is a, a, um, a better direction for some of these folks. Um, so as a, a, a sort of general tool set, 
capture as much of the, of the information as you could. And, you know, we saw a number of them that were offering constant tracking of heart rate. You know, one of the challenges of, you know, this device is it's only if I ask it to. There's battery life issues. I hunted high and low, and I'm interested to hear if you found anything that was addressing battery life, because that, for me, is the major limiting factor with all of these devices today. They sort of, they die on you, and if you can't last at least a day, um, you got a problem. What are you going to do? Are you going to change out batteries and stuff? Did you see anything along those lines? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there was a couple things. One is there was the no charge... Uh, wristwatch. I didn't actually dive into it, but I, they, they had that headline that said no charge, and I was like, if there's no charge, what does that mean? But I think one I saw, which I think also goes to the continuous monitoring thing, was um, it was from Fitlinks, and I think it was called the Amp Strip. I'm not sure if you saw right. that. Yeah. It was a strip that goes right under your, your chest, and you, you attach it, and I mean, I, at first I looked at it, and I was like, how can that have a battery in it, right? Like, how can it survive the way it is, but when you look at it, <coughs> excuse my cough, it was, it was pretty thin and it was pretty small, but I think what it is is all it's doing is doing the sensing and then it uses the battery of your cell phone. And so, you know, it can sense, I think they said it could sense, uh, I can't remember exactly if it was a day or two days, you know, there was a number of days that it could do without you know, attaching to your cell phone, and that's continuous monitoring, which I think is the other key, because that's a lot of data, continuous monitoring that way, and then they just piggyback the cell phone battery and use the cell phone battery to collect that data, which I think is a smart approach, one, because, I, I don't know, I, I, part of me says, can I, would I want to stick that on myself every day, and how long would those stickers last, and does that become kind of annoying, and do I get tired of sticking it to me? Uh, but on the other hand, if it's under the clothes, so it's kind of invisible as far as the wearables, you know, invisibles as opposed to wearables, uh, so, so it's hidden from view. Uh, you know, I imagine you could get used to it, and if it just uses the battery life of your cell phone, well, guess what? My cell phone's going to stay charged, and I don't know about you, but my Samsung S5 has had zero battery issues. Like, I don't even have, before I was always like, if I can charge, I need a charge. But now with the latest cell phones, you know, I'm not even worrying about it at all. Uh, you know, if I'm there, you know, if I go from 7 a.m. in the morning till midnight, okay, maybe I need to charge midday something. But um, so the cell phone battery has been less of an issue. And maybe that's the pathway forward for battery usage as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I also love the continuous self-monitoring. That felt interesting to me. Like, okay, is that the future of, you know, where all of this data is going? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of, like you said, of, here, let me tell it to start monitoring me. Right. I just want it to happen. It has to be a passive thing. I mean, we saw that. So, uh, you know, the Internet of Things and connecting devices. And I think people are a little bit, um, I, I, I don't know, just questioning the value of why would I need to connect my fridge. And then there's some of the issues of security around that. Do I really want my fridge sort of posting out that I took out, you know, uh, the big pot of cream or whatever it happens to be and you know put those issues to one side I think part of the reason that everybody's struggling with it is that it's not happened you know you're not seeing the connection and why that's value I'll, I'll pick an example and you, you know the weighing scales for me is a great example it's, mm -hmm. it, it's a really simple one I, we've all had weighing scales for years um, you step on them it gives you a number and you remember that number if you're really good you write it down somewhere but most people say oh, I'll remember it and then you try and transfer it into some tracking mechanism because it's not the single value that's interesting it's the trend whether it's up down you know or it's steady if we're brutally honest with ourselves and I know this happens you know I'll declare first first up I would remember that, but I would misremember it. You know, if I was completely honest, unless I wrote it down, and it wasn't a deliberate, you know, I want to misrepresent, unless I wrote it down, it wouldn't get in. Now, with my Wi-Fi connected scale that is plugged in, I want to say it's a Fitbit, maybe. I can't remember which of the various versions. I literally get on. It recognizes me based on, you know, profile and immediately goes to the cloud, it gets into my record and it's there. So I have to do nothing more than stepping on that device. And I think the same is going to be true with all of these things. It's that passive, constant monitoring. 
And you know, the same is true with my pulse. I don't want to have to remember. I don't want to have to remember to do my pulse ox. I, and all of that ties to the battery life. I think that's one of the reasons that many of these devices don't. I'll add something to yours, and you know, maybe I wish we could patent it right now. Although I, every time I look into this and I, I look for the patent, I find that but somebody's already got there, and then I see the stuff develop. But um, is the um, opportunity for um, us to use the body's battery? You know, in the same way that we plugged into the lemon and the potato at school, you know, there's some stuff we're generating all this energy, and if we can tap into it, I, I wonder if that's going to be the way that we'll sort of extend the wearable devices. But you're right, use the, the cell phone. That's got a better sort of instance of all of this, and, you know, I think that would be an improvement. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, to me, the key is that most of the tracking doesn't require a huge battery. It's the uploading. It's it's all that uh, those other items that usually wear down the battery from my experience. And, you know, it's interesting. I have the uh, eye health scale, and I'm in the same boat. It's the one tool that, I, you know, I step on it every morning. It uploads to the cloud, and it's just beautiful, and I can see the trends, and I can see it happen. But the other thing I, that I thought was interesting at CES was that it seems like there was somewhat of a maturing of the sensor space with, you know, one, that there's just a wide variety of sensors to choose from and even a lot of new entrants. And so I, and I think they're starting to really get a handle on, on, on making the sensing work. But what I haven't seen that much of is the bridge between, okay, I've got some sensors that do stuff, and, and almost like you said, you know, like, what are you going to do with that data once you have it? Right. I don't know if the sensor companies are going to provide that, right? Like, I don't, it's not in their DNA of who they are. If you're a hardware company, it's really hard for you to do software. And so will they be able to bridge that gap and provide the software that is, uh, for lack of a better term, meaningful, right. uh, that, that's useful to the consumer to take that sensor data and say, okay, now I'm going to do something cool with that sensor data. Uh, right. you know, did you see any examples of that where they bridge that gap between the two? I, so I can't say I pick. I, I agree with you with the with the, um, uh, the maturation of the, the the whole bringing together of that. Uh, you know, I, I would you know I'd call out um, Under Armour specifically because that was really their whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, when you look at, at that particular piece of the industry, it was the sports. Uh, groups um, and Adidas, um, you know, had really come out in the uh, the space around the World Cup with the monitoring, and they had tied to the winners. Um, you know, maybe they backed a bunch of other teams. I don't know, but they were behind the German team who won the World Cup. So they really stood out, um, and they, you know, displayed an awful lot of that sort of value add with the sensors that were built into the clothing. Track, uh, tracking movement using GPS, they had pulse monitors and so forth, and you, you know a lot of other folks jumped in, and I fully expected Under Armour, but instead of saying, "Hey, we're going to track it," what they said was, "We're going to try and add the value to it and s integrate with what. Wh why do we care how you sense and what you sense? We want to bring all our knowledge and experience." And they're really, you know, a lot of their work has been around sporting, to be fair, but I think the health value of that is really. How can I tune my workout? How can I get the maximum value uh, from the effort that I'm sort of putting in? So they would be the one call out that are sort of trying to do that. I can't say I saw others. Most were sort of trying to throw out this technology as best as they could, <laughs> um, you know, to capture the eyes, the minds, the thoughts. Um, you know, one of the, the recurring themes I hear is, you know, overwhelming, too much, you know, too much data. How do you bring it all together? Um, and, you know, that's a little bit of a chicken and egg. We've never had the data to be able to process it and say, what's the value of this in our sort of, you know, management of health and fitness and, you know, keeping people out of hospital. Now we've got it, I think we're going to see more of that activity that tries to bring the value add that says, I'm going to try and impact that based on the collection of all of that in tools and ways that are meaningful. You know, and maybe it is with the wearable devices. Um, I, you know, obviously, a, as a passionate believer in the speech side of things, I think these devices are a little bit impersonal, whereas voice isn't. 
and the ability to engage with somebody in a conversation with some kind of agent, even if it's just a voice. And one of the thoughts that we had a while back was, you know, could you record your mother <laughs> telling you, do you really think you should eat that cookie? Um, <laughs> how much more impactful would that be? Um, you know, that's not generated, but, you know, record. Tying it all together with voice and allowing you to interact, I think, both simplifies the interface because people are overwhelmed with all of this. And then, obviously, the, the personal nature. You know, how are we interacting? Well, it's through video, but it's the voice that's communicating all of this. There's some visual elements to all of this. And I, I think that's really going to tie all of this together. And, you know, that's a little bit of the sort of, uh, you know, corporate side of me because I'm tied to the, the speech industry. But I've always passionately believed that voice is that undercurrent sort of glue that ties all of this together. And it allows us to simplify that exchange in a way that, you know, I can say, should I be exercising now? Or, you know, it's telling me, hey, you've been sat down for the last hour. How about going and getting a cup of coffee? Easier than buzz, buzz, you know, look at it versus somebody telling me. And, you know, you start to develop that relationship with a persona, I think. And that, for me, is going to bring all this data together and make it meaningful as, you know, hijacking your term. No, I mean, so, so it was really interesting. You, you'll love this interaction I had. And, and unfortunately, I can't remember the uh, specific vendor that I was talking to. But one of, one of the digital health companies I, I ran into, they had a, a sensor of some sort. They were collecting data. They, were, they had, I think, an app, of course, associated with it. And we were talking. And, and they said, you know what we really need to do is really incorporate the voice. Because if we could voice activate this, it would just be beautiful. And and, and I heard them. And, and I need the name of that vendor. <laughs> well, I, they, 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 I was like, you're right. You know, the, this would be beautiful, right? And it just made sense with what they were doing that, you know, oh, you need voice. And I literally just said to them, I was like, but that's easy. All you do is call up Nuance and integrate their SDK, and now you have voice, which I think is really a interesting thing that, you know, these – digital health companies don't need to think about voice anymore because that's already been solved. It, it's kind of like when the iPhone started getting together and they started putting together the iPhone, they didn't go and say, oh, we need to figure out how to do uh, GPS. They didn't say, oh, we need to figure out how to do an accelerometer. No, those things have been solved and they just incorporated them. And I think that's true with voice. You know, they can just go to Nuance and get your voice capabilities and then they have it. I mean, Literally, what were the commercials we saw during the NFL games for Domino's? At least I was seeing them, right? You know, the you could talk to Dom, I think it is, right? And That's it was this voice app that says, I want a pizza, right? And it would send you a pizza. And then it says, powered by Nuance, of course, right? right. <laughs> and Domino's didn't invent that. They just you know, grabbed it from you guys, from Nuance, and did it. And I think that's true with digital health. And, and just to extend that, I think we're seeing that and we will see that even more across all of the digital health space where you're not going to have to worry about voice. You're not going to have to worry about getting temperature. You're not going to have to worry about getting heart rate. You're, not gonna, you know, you're just going to choose from the assortment, and then you're going to build cool apps on top of it. Right. I, 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 you know, obviously, Dom uh, from Domino's for us is a, an, an exciting sort of um, – poster child for how you can interact and the simplicity and you know it's concatenating all of those commands into a simple interaction um, you know with all this ubiquitous complexity um, you know voice is the simplifying agent um, in our world and you know it's not always right that's you know fair comment and I, I would never sort of advocate it for everything and everybody but I think it is part of the glue that's becoming essential. And obviously, when you walk into those halls, particularly with all of this digital health, and look at this and go, wow, how do you bring all of this together to your theme of you know, the value add of all of this data? That's going to be tied together by the, the companies that say, how do you make this useful? You know, what's going to break out? Um, I always think this at HIMSS. And you know, at HIMSS, it's a challenge. Who's going to be here next year and doing something interesting with this? I looked at CES, and, you know, unlike you, this was the first time. I, I couldn't have been – I was like a kid in a candy store. Most exciting place for me to go as a, a geek and, you know, see all this technology and, and other stuff completely unrelated, which was fun. Um, 
But, you know, I, I couldn't help walking around thinking, wow, are they going to be here next year? Do, do they survive this sort of overwhelming nature? And I think the breakouts are the folks that show and demonstrate the value. And, you know, not always, but a lot of the time that will be tied to, you know, simplifying the interaction, sometimes with voice, sometimes not. Um, I, I think the other thing that's tied to all of this is the sort of home environment and how we bring this all together so that it's just, you know, passively occurring. Um, and that connectivity and pulling all of that data in, we saw it with lots, you know, when you walk up and, you know, your phone's in your pocket, why do I have to pull out a key anymore, you know, and you don't, and that's all coming to, a, to the fore. I know people are worked up about the security of it and, you know, not to discount it, but I always put that to one side as I try and envisage the future because I think we can solve those problems, at least, you know, balance them appropriately so that we don't give up our security and control of information, but get the value. Um, you know, very much the premise we have is get a, the authorization from people to say, hey, we need to use this. Here's what you get from giving up this information. We're not going to share it necessarily, but we need it. You know, your contact database is important because we need to know the numbers and being able to communicate. So, um, you know, still nascent stages, but the one thing I would say, year four, I believe, for digital health, if you weren't excited and believing that that was going to be a breakout section of CES, you had to be this year. I, I mean, I can only imagine what it's going to be like next year. Well, uh, you know, and I keep wondering who's going to be missing. And so far, I haven't seen them disappearing. In fact, I just see their booths getting bigger and uh, having a bigger presence at CES. Uh, so you know, I, I wanna, if you've got a second, I want to talk a little bit, um, you know, what I would call the sort of back parts of the hall. It's always the place for me that's really interesting to walk around. It can be a little bit odd sometimes. You see the weirdest of things. Um, <laughs> but just fascinating to me to see folks doing things, you know, completely differently, um, uh, you know, in a way that you go, wow, that's just a fascinating application of technology or looking at things in a different, and they're typically very small and at the back. Did you see anything interesting in the, that space at all? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, the back of the hall for the Venetian, in fact, I think the Venetian was where it was at. To me, the rest of the convention center with the big booths with Samsung and Sony and Intel and all that, the, to me, they weren't that interesting, unless you loved cars, and then the North, uh, the North Hall of CES was great with the car stuff. But, um, it, it, the Venetian was where it was at. It was where digital health was at. It was where drones were at. It was where 3D printing was at. And, and there was this confluence of, of energy that was really exciting because it was re really entrepreneurial. And then in the back of the Venetian Hall was what they called Eureka Park, yeah. which is where they put all of the startup companies that are exhibiting a CES and, and you know, probably couldn't even afford a booth. So I think they have ways with the Eureka Park to get startups in there. Um, uh, and, you know, the one for me, which is actually still a digital health one, and then I'm not sure how much of a startup they even are, but it was really fascinating to see. And maybe the one time that I've seen a sensor, an app, and really a good gamification of healthcare come together in, like, one system. And that was a company called Valedo or Valido. I, I don't even know how they pronounce it, but Valedo. I, I know their website is uh, valedotherapy.com. But they have a sensor and they were focused on lower back health. Just the lower back. So in many ways the iPad was your Wii and was your screen. And they had these games that you would play with the sensor and you would go and you would stretch certain ways and you would build muscle certain ways, you could tell they were really focused on the health of it. And I thought that was a massive change in thinking because the Wii Fit was kind of a fitness thing, but it wasn't designed that. They designed something that was fun and they said, oh, guess what? This is a good workout. We should describe it as fitness, right? <laughs> Whereas this company said, I want to solve a specific health problem, which is lower back pain and lower back health, and, and they have a FDA cleared device to be able to use on it, and, and they, it was really a game though of how you play, right, and as you do it, uh, so to me that was the most exciting uh, thing that I saw, 
that was like bringing together all of the digital health space yeah. in a unique way. How about you? Um, so I, I love that, you know, and that's really sort of focus on a specific problem, find a solution, and you know, really tie all the stuff together. Which you know is the if if there's a secret to success, that's one of them. Um, Hopefully, we'll see more of that, right? <laughs> Exactly, and you know, I, I like you, Eureka Park was the place that I had the most interesting, you know, some fascinating conversations that were just outside of, you know, expectations for them and for me necessarily. Um, I, I'm going to, you know, and they're not totally new, but I saw them a while back, I think with a Kickstarter campaign, with Butterfly, uh, Butter... Hmm. Y and E Y E, I think it's capital Y. So they're a, a simple camera monitoring system, and I think they, you know, they orientated towards sort of security and security cameras originally. But the conversation I had, and you know, I, it, for me, it's always about the personal nature of healthcare, and the idea that I can literally take this device that is as simple as can be. You know, the setup is, you know, it's, it's as simple as sort of Apple setup. You know, I can mail it to my mother who's uh, 87 years old and, you know, I constantly worry about her like all, um, you know, children, relatives and so forth. And it can be put in her house. She doesn't have to have multiple of them. It's, you know, relatively inexpensive, doesn't come with all this monitoring. And, you know, my mother had one of those monitoring devices with a wrist thing and a, you know, and she fell. But, of course, the one time she fell was when she wasn't carrying it and, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the requirement to do something. And here's a device that says, not only can I monitor, but it's the intelligence that's built in. It's, you know, using that data in a way that says, hey, I expect to see you get up in the morning and come into the room. And I can tell the difference between you and a dog and you know so the security thing plays into that but now I'm saying well, I haven't seen mum get up this morning and you know tied together with voice there's a, a an audio channel built into that the device can have a communication and say are you okay no response or a response no um, and the ability to then drop in and out obviously with authorization I mean it's I, I'm, I'm looking at this not as a sort of I want to keep an eye on you, it's, hey, I'm, I care about you, and I want to make sure that you're okay. Um, and I just love this, the simplicity of setting it up, the cost effectiveness, but the sort of just general sense of comfort I get from that that says, I'm sure that she's okay, you know, and I can just drop in and see that she moved in and out. For me, that was the, the, you know, like you tying together something, and it's it's personal. You know, I've got an 80, 87 year old mother that I'm concerned about that's in another country. Doesn't matter. Easy to set up. That was the conversation that I had that really sort of, you know, I, I was excited about, and I, I'm I'm going to have more discussions with them, and I'm sure I'm going to set something up. And I think they were sort of, you know, looking to pivot a little bit, and you know move away from security and look towards more the healthcare scene as a, a you know possible target. Interesting. No, I've seen an interesting evolution in those uh, kind, kind of the senior living, the home health uh, devices. In fact, although it wasn't as big this year as, as some of the past years. Uh, maybe those were some of the missing companies. But uh, I, you know, I always said it's amazing how you can track and what you can track with just an accelerometer, GPS, right. and and some connectivity, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's 3G, right. 4G, whatever. Uh, you know, when you have that combination, you know, th I've seen other companies uh, in the senior space that are basic. You know, it's usually it's a wristband or a necklace or something, which, you know, we could argue whether that's great or not. But you know, like they said, they track the movement and they say, well, your baseline is that you move 70% or whatever the number is that they assign to that much movement, which they can track with the GPS, with the accelerometer. And then now, if normally you're at 70 and now you're at 40, hmm, maybe I need to notify your caregiver and let them know, hey, there's a decrease in activity. Why don't you go stop by the house? Why don't you give them a call? Why don't you, know, you do it? You know? But it's a mixture of these technologies. And I love the idea of the camera as well. You know, I think that adds one other layer. So right. camera, accelerometer, GPS, and connectivity. Yeah. Powerful combination. Yeah. Very cool.
Cool. So let's just wrap this up with uh, you know one last question, kind of. So let's imagine you're a doctor. Oh yeah, you are, and a, or say a hospital CIO or you know someone that's looking at CES. What would be your big takeaway for them, right? The the industry people working in the healthcare industry. What's your big takeaway? What should they think about when they think about what happened at CES and what they should plan for for the future? So I I think I would pull that all together into, I, I, you know, maybe some of this is, you know, obviousity, um, if that's even a word. Um, the world's changing, and it's changing very quickly. Um, I, I really strongly believe that, uh, you know, if I was a hospital CIO, I'm looking at my um, future and my the future of my business and it's not about my bricks and mortar in this big building and building more buildings I think we're going to see more of this pushed out that the home health monitoring and keeping people out of my institution is part of the sort of fundamental direction of healthcare and you know that impacts me in some good and, and negative ways the negative is hey I've got this infrastructure that I have to service and you know I've got to justify it so I think we're going to see a consolidation you know, which is difficult for people that live remote. So telemedicine is one of the things that, you know, I see as the benefits of this. How can I deliver a better service to remote folks? Do they really have to come in? There is technology that can absolutely support me in that whole process. But then the other thing I'm looking at is all of this data, you know, to your point, how do I bring it in? You know, I think we've got to stop this barrier approach, that's not my data, I'm not interested in it, don't overwork, you know, we generate it, we capture it, my EHR, that's not the case, uh, you know, it's about me, it's always about me, um, and by that I mean the patient, and they have to move with the times to pull all of this in, so look at all of that, see how you can play best, so some of this is integration of data. Um, the you know, the positive thing from me, from an a IT guy, is look at this world of opportunity. If, if you can't walk around there and go, wow, I, you know, the, all these things that I could potentially apply, and, you know, there's a sequencing. How do I focus the right amount of attention is, is important. But then, you know, the, the, the fine-tuning of that is about delivering value to the customers. And the customers are changing. They're going to manage their own healthcare, and they need to stay out of hospital. You have to balance that with, you know, servicing your hospital infrastructure. Um, if I had an overriding message, it would be, albeit it's a busy show, it's overwhelming, but I think it should be at least on the um, list of places that CIOs should consider attending, especially the digital health. There was a separate conference, separate stream that I think was highly valuable. Even if you're not going, you should have representation there to understand and be able to move with that future in the times. Interesting. Uh, it, it's amazing. We talked about you know for over a half hour, and and we never even mentioned telemedicine, which uh, I think is a huge. Yeah thing for them. Uh, I agree completely. Uh, so I love the telemedicine angle. And I think the other one that you know I would sum up in one one word, which is data. And and how are you going to handle this deluge of data that you know it extends beyond just what we've talked about and what we saw at CES. They're dealing with it with the EHR. They're dealing with it from all these sensors. Eventually we're going to have genomic data, we're going to have healthcare interoperability data, we're going to have you know, Watson-like data that pulls data from all the medical journals and, and understands that so you can provide evidence-based care. And, and there's going to be this deluge of data and how are you going to approach this data and, and deal with that in your organization and provide value to the patients is, is, uh, is a good message for all the, the doctors and hospital CIOs. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, having this chat. Uh, hopefully some people get some, some good insights of CES, and uh, I imagine it will continue to grow next year even bigger, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely uh, see how this all progresses. So thanks so much for, for uh, coming by and, and talking with us. Always a pleasure, John. Thanks for the opportunity.